We will now have a tribute by Andrew Puckery. Good evening to all. I know it's still early, but good evening nevertheless. On October the 15th, 2023. Uh -huh. Maybe now? Okay. On October the 15th, 2023, Margaret Elaine Carter, Maggie to her family and those who were closest to her, completed her earthly journey. And as I reflect on her life and our relationship, I'm reminded that a teacher once said to me that life is a journey. We do not know where we are going, how we will get there, but along the way we'll meet others who will have an influence on us, and in turn, they will impact our lives and who will shape our relationships. Thank you. So when I was asked by her family to speak on their behalf today, I realized that she was one of those people who the teacher spoke about. 
So who was Maggie? And how did I come to that conclusion? Maggie was one of nine children of Winfield and Pearl Wilkinson. There were a lot of things in which she was involved, but nothing and no one was more important and dearer than family. She was always at the forefront of the family, first to share and care. She would be the one to take charge when the situation required. If there was ever any doubt, being part of the seasonal family celebrations at Christmas and Easter at her home would put any such notions to rest. Her sisters, Audine and Avril, tell it, Maggie was always ready to take care of others and would put those in need before herself. She believed in the good of people and it was difficult to ta task to get her to accept that some people would deceive her. She would swear for a friend and be quick to forgive. Maggie was the mother of two girls, Jillian and Jennifer. If you were fortunate to witness Maggie's attention and devotion to the nurture and well-being of her girls, you would have seen an exhibition of the requisite traits for a good mother. She was involved in every aspect of their lives. Sports, there were two good tennis players, by the way, and academics. Her personal reports would highlight their progress with pride and satisfaction. Thoroughly involved in their social life, their friends were not only frequent visits to their home, but often Maggie would personally provide their means of transportation to their various activities. And there were, and there were times when she would provide motel accommodation at number 16 Bannantyne, particularly when extended or excessive activities exceeded their curfew. And getting home individually was not always achievable. Jillian, speaking for herself, and Jennifer, our friends always liked coming to our house because there was always some macaroni pie or lasagna and a glass of tang for them. She was always there when we needed help, a loyal and dependable friend to her friends and to ours. As a mom, though far away, we always knew we could count on her, call her for advice, even when we didn't necessarily want the advice or had a difference of opinion. We knew she would do anything for us, and she did. One of Jennifer's college friends, also named Jennifer, planned a vacation in Barbados with another friend. Mommy said, give her our phone number in case they needed anything. Jen, this is this Jen, ended up calling Mommy, who picked them, from, picked them up from the hotel and took them to lunch at the coach house. Mommy had never met Jen, but that's just who she was. Jen was a friend of Jennifer's, so Mommy was going to take care of her. There were a couple of friends who I think preferred talking to Mommy more than to us. She was Auntie Margaret to all. An incident. One night, two of Jen's friends showed up at our house around midnight seeking help. They had a problem. They had been seeking autographs with some young visiting cricketers when one of them went off and could not be located. <laughs> Mommy promptly got dressed, went out, found her, and took her home. Margaret's nephews. The girl's friends were not the only ones who were fond of Maggie's good graces and culinary fare. This is from Scott. Scott resides in Canada, and Scott says her hospitality is forever fetched, etched story in his memory, recalling that there was never a time when he visited that she did not organize a family lunch. The highlight of which was her fish cakes. Enough said. Those things and her infectious laugh was everything I could ask for while in Barbados. From Raymond, Raymond is in London. It still feels unreal that Auntie Margaret is no longer with us. A lot of my memories of her revolve around St. David's Church, and strangely enough, food. Whether it was her, the feast she prepared for the family's Easter and Christmas lunches, or making sure we were all present at St. David's Church annual barbecue. Auntie Margaret had a way of getting me to eat things no one else could. Yam pie, cuckoo, to name a few. In his words, she was a culinary wizard. But there's something she did constant, consistently that I truly appreciated. Every time I returned home on vacation, and we're back to food again, huh? 
Auntie Margaret had a macaroni pie and 10 flying fish waiting for me. That was my taste of home. That was my comfort food. He goes on to say, Auntie Margaret, thank you for your unwavering kindness and support over the years. Your gestures, especially those culinary ones, meant the world to me. Rest easy until we meet again. Church. Margaret was a faithful member of this church, and it would be an understatement to say that she was involved in its activities. Better put, would be to say that she served her church by the biblical counsel found in James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man may say he have faith and have not works? Can save him? Can faith save him? Her contributions to the church were to the sanctuary team, the flower guild, Friday team preparation of the weekly bulletin, the tea party stall, and the note from a church member says she loved tea parties. So everything had to be just right, even made special tablecloths for those occasions. Organizing the desert table at the annual barbecue, prepare and serve lunch on Ash Wednesday, and then provided regular desserts for regular church functions. Maggie's contribution to her church. Maggie, the grandmother, grandchildren are the most wonderful gifts of creation. That's my thought and life's rewards for being a grandparent. Maggie would be so rewarding. Gillian's daughter, Kaya, would come into her life, and with that abundance of pride and satisfaction that she felt for her daughters, Kaya's progress and achievements would be celebrated. The following comes under the heading of the ties that bind or how our lives became intertwined. Approximately 45 years ago, Maureen Ains, some of you may know her by that name, invited me to go to a friend's house for lunch on Christmas Day. Her friend was Maggie, present with the members of the Wilkinson and Carter families. I had no idea that I would be spending one Christmas with Maggie and family, far less every year after that. In time, lunch at Easter will be added to the family celebrations calendar. A few years later, Maureen Ains would become Maureen Puckering. I think you know her now. And Jillian would be her flower girl. Maureen and I would have two sons, and Maggie would be godmother to the younger, Brian. Over the years, Maggie would involve me in family activities with regard to Jillian. On her 18th birthday at a lunch in her honor, I was asked to say a few words. And on her wedding day, there I was, speaking on behalf of the bride. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to have been given the opportunity to speak on behalf of Margaret, the lady whom I met along life's journey, and to share my appreciation that she made my family her friends. The day after Maggie passed, I wrote to Jillian to offer condolences, and after thanking me, she said, condolences to you too, you, our family. I believe that we have arrived at the point where we understand the impact and influences Maggie had on her family and friends, and how she shaped her relationships. Before we say our last goodbye to Margaret, I offer a few words on the topic of life and its journey. Life is but a stopping place, a pause in what's to be, a resting place along the road to sweet eternity. We all have different journeys, different paths along the way. We all were meant to learn some things, but never meant to stay. Our destination is a place far greater than we know. For some, the journey is quicker. For some, the journey is flow. And when the journey finally ends, we claim a great reward to find an everlasting peace together with the Lord. Amen. Hymn number 427. 427.
Margaret. And we pray that having opened to her the gates of larger life, you will receive her more and more into your joyful service, that with all who have served you in the past, she may share in the eternal victory of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Can you say for the first Bible reading by Robert Cumberbatch? The reading is taken from Philippians chapter 4, and I'm just reading a few verses from 4 to 7, and it goes like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, for the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The first reading. The 23rd Psalm, Psalm number 23. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 1 to 9. Early on the first day of the week, 
While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must, might rise, must rise from the dead, then the disciples return to their homes. Here ends the reading. The hymn before the sermon, number 476, hymn number 476. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The 14th verse of the fourth chapter of the first letter to the Thessalonians. The 14th verse 
of the fourth chapter of the first letter to the Thessalonians. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. This first letter to the Thessalonians, the experts on the New Testament tell us that it would have been written rather late in Paul's ministry. That as he writes this letter, he is writing at the end of a long life of ministry, a long life of ups and downs and ins and outs with our Lord, a life in which he had experienced so much, so much perhaps of the joys that there are in serving God. And also too, so much, so much, and so many of the so many of the challenges of which he would himself write about from time to time. Many of those challenges, the whole understanding of of shipwrecks and imprisonments and all of his very experiences. But in the midst of all that he had gone through, his faith and belief in God was unwavering. It was, it was steadfast. And so as he, as he writes this letter, a number of things seem to be going through his mind. He seems to be thinking that the return of the risen Lord will have been imminent. He seemed to be of the view that our Lord would put in his appearance during his own lifetime. So in other words, he's thinking that the parousia would have occurred while he was still while he was still alive, while he was he was still here. But also he realized that some time had been going by, so he's caught almost, as it were, in a time in between. And so during that time, he was yet of the view that he must continue to work for his Lord. And he would encourage all of those around him to do the same, to work for God and to labor in his vineyard. There are a number of things that he would have seen as well. He would have seen a number of his colleagues being executed for their faith. A number of those who have been executed for their faith under the Emperor Nero. And so one of the things he also had to do was to give faith and courage to those who remain so that they would not lose heart. So here comes this, this letter that he, he writes as he wants, to, he wants to encourage persons to, to hold on to their faith, to hold on to their hope. And he will say in another part of Scripture that hope will never disappoint us. Hope will never disappoint us. That if there is one thing that the Christian has, it is, it is a hope. It is a hope. And for Paul, hope is different from optimism. What Paul is saying is, however it turns out, whether good or bad, there is that assurance that God Almighty will be by your side. And so this is, this is his every confidence. His entire confidence is in the resurrection of 
O Lord. O Lord, who himself will pass through the path and passage of death to life eternal. He will pass through the path and passage of death to life eternal. Death would be for our Lord. The means by the means by which he could mystically remain with all of us forever. There is a there is a beautiful hymn that we sing, a, a hymn that speaks of the redemption brought for us in, in Christ. We sing it very often on Good Friday. So those who go to church on Good Friday only would know, you know, would know this hymn. There's a green hill far away. You know there's a green hill far away. There was <laughs> there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. And that, that was every confidence for, for this blessed apostle. And it must be our every confidence. So when we come to services such as this one, it is, that, it is with that kind of understanding that we come. It is with the kind of understanding that we have a Lord and a God for whom death is only a gateway, a portal, but it does not single, it is not a sign of the end. It is not a sign of the end. But rather, but rather for Paul and many of the early Christians, it was a new beginning, it was a birth. So the early Christians, would gather at the grave of those whom they, they, whom they had known and whom they had loved. And they would do so on the anniversary of the time they died, the day they died. For indeed, for the early, in early Christian thought, the day of death in the world was a time of rebirth or new birth in another world on another shore and in another place. And so that has been the origin of the communion of saints. So when we celebrate the feast day of a saint, we are celebrating in one sense the day in which that saint died. But in another sense, in a deeply spiritual and theological sense, we are celebrating the day of new birth. And so our Lord comes to us and he gives us this, this promise that we shall remain with him forever. And so it is, it is with this in our hearts that we come this afternoon to say farewell to our departed sister Margaret, who for us, who for us, for many of us, was so full of joy, so filled with life, so filled with excitement and enthusiasm that for so many of us, there's still this feeling that, you know, we're going to see Margaret sitting around here somewhere, this, 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 this thing in our heads, this thing in our heads. Our departed sister, a faithful member of this church, of this St. David's church. And she loved God. And she loved the church. And she loved the ministry of the church. And she was fully and actively involved in the ministry and the work and the life of the church. We give thanks to God for this. For in this, Margaret is a tremendous witness and example for many of us, for many of us. You could almost say hardly anything happened 
and Margaret was not aware of things around this place. She was a member of the Flower Guild. I think that was mentioned. She was a member of the Flower Guild. She worked within the context of the sanctuary, within the context of the sanctuary. So in that, in that way, she participated in the liturgy of the church. I always say to people, you know, if you want to see the church at work, if you really want to see the church at work, don't only come, don't, don't only come like Easter day, come the day before. Come the day before. Come the day before. Don't, don't, only, don't only come Christmas day, come the day before. Come the day before. And you see the church a buzz and a light with persons working and preparing and all the preparations that are being done. It's one thing to come and see the flowers and so on all later. That's one thing. It's another thing. So I take pictures of them sometimes, to tell you the truth. I take my camera, I take pictures of them sometimes. Sometimes they don't even know until they post them on Facebook. It's another thing to come by the church and to see the ladies, some of the fellows too, but to see the ladies fixing and pulling up and looking back and they're looking forward and they're checking to make sure everything is all right. That is something to see. That is something to see. So Margaret was one of those, was one of those persons. One of my first real encounters with Margaret, though, was at the tea stall, at the fair, the tea stall. It was in the tea stall that I think Margaret reigned. She, she, didn't, she didn't just handle the tea stall. She didn't just take care of it. Margaret presided over the tea stall, over the tea stall. that was hers. And, and any, and any, but you, if you know Margaret, you know what I mean. And any, at any event that we were having here at the church, we put the, the tea part of it in Margaret's hands. And she ruled it, you know, she ruled over it. You know, in this, in this parish here, you know, we like Margaret Bad. There, there are times when, you know, the, the first time that some of us had cooking with sandwiches is when we met Margaret. And sometimes she would give you a little scone or a little slice of bread and she would say, have this with your coffee this afternoon. Have this with your coffee this afternoon. Whenever we're having an event, Margaret provided, the, or sister was providing the desserts and so on. That was her area. But her life of, her life of faith, though, she was, Margaret was one of the first persons to return to the Mass. I, I, I almost said after COVID, because I'm not too sure if to say after COVID, in COVID, because I'm not quite too sure where we are. But when, 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 we could, when we could sort of venture back out, step gingerly back out into the public again, into places like this again, Margaret was among the first group of persons, you know, when at first, you know, there were 10 of us and they could have 20 and they could have 40 and, you know, so Margaret was among that early set of persons, that early set of persons. So we, we really give thanks to God Almighty for her life. But you see, it's not only the life of Margaret, though. See, one doesn't understand is the life of Christ, is the life of Christ within her the life of Christ that was within her. And that life of Christ is within us as well. 
that, that, that spark that Jesus Christ brings to the world is within us as well. So that we too are quite capable, like the saints of old, like St. Paul, like our departed sister. We are all capable, we all have that capacity to work within the church, to give our lives, give ourselves over to God so that God Almighty will use us according to the gifts and the skills that he has given to us. And so this is, these, these services like this one brings us face to face with the true and living God, the one who dies for us, the one who rose again for our justification. So that in our own lives, in our own work, and in our own witness, we seek to do justice to the God who loves us by returning that love for God, by loving God and our neighbor, and working for him and his church. As we say farewell then to our sister, we say to her to rest in Christ. With every confidence that Margaret will hear those immortal words, well done, good and faithful servant. And so to the sorrowing relatives, we say to you to find your strength, to be able to stand up, to find your strength kneeling, find your strength on your knees. And as I said to someone recently, in order to keep on running in this world, walk with Jesus. For he is the one to give you that strength and that grace that will help you to meet the days to come with hope and with courage and with faith. And so on behalf of all the members of this parish of St. David, on behalf of our parochial church council, on behalf of her partner, Muriel, on behalf of the Archdeacon, Father Alan Jones, on my own behalf, we extend to you our deepest sympathy. And we urge you to be aware of the prayerful support of the church. Rest eternal grant unto her, O Lord, and let life perpetuate. May she rest in peace. Amen. After each petition, your response is, hear us, Lord. For our sister Margaret, let us pray to the Lord Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you console Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to, the, to us who mourn for Margaret and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, Lord. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, Lord. 
You raise the dead to life. Raise our sister to eternal life. Hear us, Lord. You promise paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our sister to the joys of heaven. Hear us, Lord. Our sister was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give her fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, Lord. She was nourished with the body and blood. Grant her a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Hear us, Lord. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our sister. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our sister Margaret, who was reborn by water and the Spirit in holy baptism. Grant that her death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. Please stand for the commendation by the Venerable Eric Lynch. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant Margaret with your saints. We have sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign of life everlasting. You only are mortal, the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. We are from pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. Would you repeat after me? Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. As our Savior Christ has commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father. Let us commend our sister Margaret to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Deliver your servant Margaret, our sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil, and set her free from every bond, that she may rest with all your saints in the eternal habitations, wherewith the Father and the Holy Spirit to live and reign, one God forever and ever. Amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend this to your servant. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto her, O Lord. And then thy perpetual shine upon her. May she rest in peace. Amen. May her soul and the souls of all the faithful departed through the tender mercies of God rest in peace and rise in glory.
Team number 314 nine, 
Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and giving life to those in the tomb. The Son of Righteousness is gloriously risen, giving light to those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. The Lord will guide our feet into the way of peace, having taken away the sin of the world. Christ will open the kingdom of heaven to all who believe in his name, saying, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Into paradise, may the angels lead you. At thy coming, may the martyrs receive you and bring you into the holy city, Jerusalem. May the choir of angels receive you. And if Lazarus wants poor, may you have eternal rest.
Everyone the Father gives to me will come to me and will never turn away anyone who believes in me. You who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give new life to a mortal body through his indwelling spirit. My heart therefore is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy and, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this. I pray the dead who die in the faith of Christ. Henceforth says the spirit, they may rest from their labors, for they take with them the record of their deeds. In the midst of life, you are in death, to whom can we turn for help? But to you, Lord, who are justly angered by our sins. Lord God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, holy and most merciful Savior, deliver us from the bitter pains of eternal death. You know the secrets of our hearts. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins, and at our last hour, let us not fall away from you. Ensure so the hope of resurrection to eternal life to our Lord Jesus Christ. We commend to Almighty God, our sister Margaret. We commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we beseech in your infinite goodness to give us grace to live in your dear love and to die in your favor. That many of our beloved sons shall come again in judgment. Both this, our sister, and we ourselves may be found acceptable in thy sight. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. Grant, O Lord, to all who have believed the spirit of faith and courage, that they may have strength to meet the days to come with steadfastness and patience, not sorrowing as those without hope, but in thankful remembrance of your great goodness, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto her, O Lord. May her soul and the souls of all the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. The hymn 387.
when we all get to heaven. I serve a risen Savior. Just the time I need it, he's 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us depart in peace. Thank you. 